I do believe it was a fluke. Uh, when you look at, uh, especially with his connection with the district, no one knew who he was. He didn't have a record. Uh, he doesn't even live in the district now. His kids don't go to school in the district. The last congressional race to be decided in 2018 is ready for yet another slugfest. The rematch is on. David Valadeo launching his 2020 campaign, seeking to take back his seat from T.J. Cox, the former congressman in studio. But does it change the culture of policing like Governor Newsom says? In my opinion, it does not. For the first time, Clovis's new top cop opens up one on one with Police Chief Kurt Fleming. Why he says the new deadly force law doesn't change a thing. And our panel of political pundits for the week. They take on how the sequel between Valadeo and Cox will play out. And could a form of marijuana be legalized on school campuses? It's all on KC24 Sunday Morning Matters. Now, from KC24, your local election headquarters, with your host, Alexan Balakian. This is Sunday Morning Matters. And good Sunday morning to you. I'm Alexan Balakian. Thanks for joining us. You can also join the conversation at Real Alexan. Use the hashtag Sunday Morning Matters. Along the way, NBA veteran and Valley native Quincy Pondexter joins me here in studio for an exclusive conversation on his future at City Hall and in politics. But first, the rematch officially on. David Valadeo running for District 21 seat, the same seat he lost in the last congressional race to be decided in 2018, punctuating that blue wave. Valadeo lost his seat in a shocking turn of events where on election night he was up 5,000 votes and ended up losing to TJ Cox by less than 900 votes. And now Valadeo looking to avenge that loss. And the former congressman joining me now, David Valadeo, how are you? Not bad, how are you? You ready to do this again? Yeah, I'm excited. All right, well, you know, the last time we spoke, you were at the Mike Pence USMCA uh, rally there in Lemoore. Uh, at that time, you said you weren't ready to make a decision. Um, what was the deciding factor for you to finally say, all right, I'm ready, I'm going to do this again? No, I just still have to run a few more traps with my family, uh, with... Uh just family in general was mainly the thing that was holding us up and making sure everyone was okay. And that's not just my wife and kids, but obviously my dad, my mom, uh, my brothers, uh, making sure that family is fully engaged and, and also supportive. But you're a competitive guy. I think the moment you lost your seat, you wanted to get back into this. Yes. Um, yeah, obviously you don't like to lose, and especially me. I'm a very competitive person. I, I take things very seriously, and uh, and we do our best as a team. And uh, frustrated, but to sit there and say the next morning, no, it wasn't like that at all. Uh, at, for a period of time, I even thought about not doing it again, but uh, obviously the time changed. You know, on election night, uh, November 6, 2018, you know it well, obviously. Uh, you tweeted, you declared victory. Yeah. Uh, a lot of us media types, we thought you were the winner. You well, were up by 5,000 votes. You went to bed that night thinking you were the winner. And if you look back, we waited for the AP to call it. Mm -hmm. We knew it was going to be tough. Our polling told us a week out that it was going to be a tough election, and so we knew. Um, when the AP called it, we ran with it. And, uh, and even if you watch back in my interviews that night, I remember saying, like I do every election, because we always know things tighten up, that uh, we know numbers will get tighter, and, uh, but we're hopeful that they'll hold and we should be fine. Were you shocked? I mean, what, I mean, were you absolutely shocked that things were turning the way they did? No. Um, you know, and I'm not an arrogant person. And so it, it's something that I always thought was just this huge honor for mm -hmm. the people that entrust me to run, uh, to, to take and represent them in Washington. And so I was always thrilled to have that opportunity, but I always knew that there was no guarantees in life. And so, no, I, I was never shocked. Um, I knew it was going to be tough. I knew that historically, uh, president's first terms, there's always issues. Obama had it. Bush had it. It is what it is. But as far as myself, no, I wasn't shocked. I did my best. But knowing what you, you've been through three times before, you were a third term congressman at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and when you were looking, hey, I'm 5,000 votes ahead. Can you honestly sit here and tell me that T.J. Cox's victory in your eyes was not a fluke? Oh, no, I, I do believe it was a fluke. Uh, when you look at, uh, especially with his connection to the district, no one knew who he was. He didn't have a record. Uh, he doesn't even live in the district now. His kids don't go to school in the district. I mean, no connection to that community at all whatsoever. 
and he comes along. I mean, like I said, historically, we know that uh, the president's party always struggles in their first term. We knew that we were going to struggle. But this is the last congressional race in the country. <laughs> yeah, it was literally the last one called in the yeah. country. That close, 862 votes. And you're not going to forget that, are you? No, uh, but it, you can't let that drive you. At the mm -hmm. end of the day, the reason why we run for office and the reason why I jumped in is because I care about my community. I care about my neighbors. I want to make sure that we do what's best for their futures. But there is a reason why he was elected for whatever reason that was. He resonated with voters and he turned it around. Out. So what is different this time around that says, I will beat him? Well, he's got a record now. And so he's got a record of doing nothing. And that right there is huge. When people elect people to Congress, when a, cons a community elects people to Congress, they expect them to stand up and do something for them. Right now, we're not seeing that. We're seeing someone who goes back there just to add to the fight and add fire uh, or, or add fuel to that fire where nothing gets done. I've got fellow uh, members of Congress who call me all the time and say we literally do nothing because new leadership here just wants to pass messaging bills. It's a waste of time. Appropriations process is slowed to a halt. As far as uh, any serious conversation or dialogue across the aisle is dead, I mean, it's just so toxic. And you don't need another person there throwing more fuel on that flame. You need people who are willing to work across the aisle and look for ways to work together. Well, let me ask you this because, you know, T.J. Cox has been in your same seat on this very program. I peppered him about his financial uh, disclosures that didn't come out to the, to the campaign and that have recently come out within the last month. Um, and it's been well documented. You've had some financial troubles as well. A lot of people believe this will be the dialogue of this campaign. Um, of course, your uh, dairy farm, you had financial troubles there. You had to claim bankruptcy uh, listing. Was it more than 100 debtors uh, off on that bankruptcy? Um, how do you plan, though, to turn that around and say, hey, I'm good for farmers, I'm good for businesses and farmers, knowing that's on your record? So there's two very different situations that you're talking about here, though. One, if you follow the dairy industry in California and the nation, dairy struggled for a very long time. The last mm -hmm. 10 years have been very, very hard on dairy. The 09 turn down, uh, uh, downturn that we had in our market destroyed a lot of dairy families. I grew up watching my friends slowly one by one lose their dairies. I knew, we all know, at some point you could be next on the bottom of the food chain and, and go. That's the problem with the dairy industry. It's always been like that. It's, it's sad. It's a very, very difficult business, but it wasn't poor management. It wasn't anything to that front. It was literally just bad market conditions, and it's something that almost every dairy farmer in the state of California and the nation has seen it, people it, go through. His situation is a little bit different. When you're literally taking money and putting it into a campaign and not paying people, I mean, that's not just dishonesty. That's, that's th Wait, are you telling me that T.J. Cox used money that he raised outside in his businesses? Did he not loan his campaign money? I have no idea. He just you, if you're telling me that, is that what you're saying? No, it, it's, it's the case. We do know that. Mm -hmm. Okay. How much of that is going to be the dialogue of this campaign, though? How much are you... Uh, we know how the commercials go. We know how yeah. the ads go. I think how nasty are, is this going to get? I think there are bigger issues to worry about today. Uh, I think there are much bigger issues, and I, I would prefer we stay on the issues that affect people at home, and that's what's most important. You say that, but we know how this is going to go, right? Well, we can't control a lot of the outside groups. We can't control everything, but at the end of the day, us as candidates, we can control that. We can control our message. We can control what we talk about on, uh, on different programs. And he's well ahead on campaign dollars. Uh, are you, how are you expecting to catch up here? I've got to work hard. Where, where, you know, you have aligned yourself mostly with President Trump's vision, right? And you say dairy farms have been down. We know the trade with China is going on. How do you change that narrative to, to make sure that the farmers who voted for Trump aren't, aren't getting off that bandwagon, so to speak, because they've ended up, you know, claiming bankruptcy because of the, the climate that you guys are in. So, one, the dairy situation has been going on much longer than President Trump's ever been and was in office. This started, I mean, the really hard one hit us in 09, uh, 2010. That was in, in the very beginning of the Obama administration. People struggle from that point forward. As far as trade right now and what's going on with farmers, you've got a lot of markets opening up. And so if you look at what's going on with the, the opportunity we have in Japan, you've got the opportunity right now with the USMCA, which this Congress has failed to bring up for a vote, even though the other countries have already supported it. Mm -hmm. And uh, those are opportunities to help us. One thing that agriculture wants more than anything is to not have one market for their product. And if all you talk about is China, that's basically essentially given up every other market in the, in the world. And this president has tried to spread, uh, spread things out. The Japan, USMCA, 
Korea, US. Those are all opportunities. European Union is another one that he's trying to work out a deal with right now, the UK. The more we spread out and, and, and target more markets, the better off we are. We cannot allow China to be our one and only market and our save all for all of our products. And I think that's a good direction. As far as trade policy that's going on right now and, and the debate that's going on with mm -hmm. the president and uh, the Chinese government is obviously very important. They can come to an agreement, but if they don't find some way to enforce whatever agreement is made, what's the purpose? And that's the, the sticking point that the Chinese administration has pulled back from, is they don't want us to be able to enforce the rules. You sound like you're in mid-election season form already. <laughs> David Valadeo, we appreciate your time. We have much more from him on Sunday Morning Matters Extra. You can catch that on yourcentralvalley.com. And still to come, the Fresno County proposal that has Fresno mayoral candidate Andrew Jans thinking about taking legal action, why he says he's being targeted. Next.